It's the 19th century. Industry is transforming the British Isles. A divide opens up between city and country. What you've got is an influx and a boom of population as it is, and people struggling to keep up. Great Britain was the first country in the world to have experienced all the wonder, the excitement, the division, uh, the conflict of a mass urban industrial society. It's this period of massive dynamism and also massive anxiety. It's the ultimate test of the artist, how to respond to the upheaval in lives and the landscape, how to portray poverty and squalor, how to handle the lure of new money, who succeeds and who fails. You can see it in architecture, you can see it in literature, you can see it in painting. The city is bewildering, a place where anything is possible. This is the rise of the Victorian city seen through creativity, culture that embraces the future versus culture trapped by the past. What is really hard for us to grasp, I think, is that this art is a protest against 19th century Britain. This is just one chapter in an epic journey. Across 1,500 years, through eight dramatic turning points of history, as contemporary artists and thinkers encounter artworks that defined their age. Man, can he paint. Exploring extraordinary creations from around the UK. What I love about it, it looks like the deck of a ship. The work of past visionaries, mavericks and rule breakers who responded to their times and shaped the future. Yeah, got it, got it, got it, this is it. Oh, look at that. Well, I want to cry. Tracing a story of creativity, revealing an alternative history of these islands told through art. What was started by the Industrial Revolution has had a global impact. 200 years on, over a 1,000 miles away in the Alps, the effect is playing out in the climate. Artist Olafur Eliasson is here to unveil a new sculpture that measures the change. There's a glacier here. It is as our glaciers melting at an incredible speed. It's like so hard to understand the glacier melting, but it's actually kind of cold here. So I'm hoping to bring to this area here a sort of sensitizing, you know, to somehow make the, well, to make the invisible visible. Artists like Eliasson have long charted the cost of industry. Eliasson is inspired by a British pioneer who captured the changing skies of his own time with fresh eyes. Arguably, the first environmental artist, J.M.W. Turner. And Turner, I think, had that courage to say, I'm just going to sort of give, give space to the sort of invisible. In the history of art, there was the depiction of stuffed landscapes, figures, and animals and so on. And suddenly, Turner started to have this sort of nothing but atmosphere. And this notion of um, painting the unpaintable, or maybe painting what we cannot see. Rain steam, speed, and that is what you get in this canvas. You're surrounded by 
this eruption of steam and smoke that is bilging out of this oncoming train. Turner really wants to create for the spectator the effect of force of the locomotive coming right out towards you. He wants people to feel exhilarated and absolutely terrified. Turner, an eccentric outsider, is perhaps the most complete artist of the century. He's made his name painting the untamed forces of nature. But he also finds new ways to capture the changing modern world with a free, radical style that preempts the Impressionists by 40 years. Change is coming. The future is coming. And Turner captures it both as a threat, as a warning, but also as a set of possibilities. And you can see on the riverbank a group of figures. They almost look like sirens warning us of something. On the other side, a farmer plowing his field, defiantly in the way that he has and his forefathers have for generations. But it's not about that agrarian, peaceful farmer. This is about forging a future in fire and smoke and grit. And in front, on the train track, running towards us, almost running for its life, it seems, is a hare running down the track as the train barrels down the line toward it. There is a now a man-made cloud, a man-made cloud that's traveling fast. And many people are seeing that the environment around them is changing, the very atmosphere is changing. Our concern now about climate change and, and, and what industrial manufacture is doing to the air we breathe is nothing new. Turner is also depicting something which is not standing still. He has depicted time. There's a train coming out of the painting, right? It's going into the future, and it's taking you with it. So I think that the Turner had this idea, which is not about where we come from, but it's actually more about where, we, where we're going from here. But I find that very inspiring. Even though it's very unclear what tomorrow is, I do think we must believe that tomorrow is better, otherwise we're gonna go backwards. Back in early 19th century England, even before the railway had been invented, a very different kind of artist thinks he's seen that future, and he doesn't like it. He fears disaster ahead and absolutely wants to go backwards. The woods, the hedgerows, the turnips, the tares, the fallows, the sheepfolds and the flocks. It's a wonderful example of the way in which writing can produce a sense of nostalgia even whilst it's being written. With every turn of your head, a different and fresh set of these, which I, at any rate, could look at with pleasure forever. The world's already changing rapidly before Cobbett's eyes. With a radical voice but a deeply conservative outlook, William Cobbett vents his fury at the new industry he sees sucking the life out of the countryside. Cobbett is most notoriously, perhaps, I suppose, a ranter. He's an angry man. Cobbett regards himself as, as the great radical outsider railing against urban corruption as opposed to rural virtue. What injustice. I am ashamed to ride a fat horse while these wretched countrymen of mine are nothing but skin and bone. They toil to get the wheat and the meat ready, only to be carried away and devoured by the tax eaters. We could think about William Cobbett as the kind of Nigel Farage of the, of the early 19th century. It's a series of sort of punches on the nose, almost, in terms of political writing. 
part of his radical agenda is that Britain needs to look after its working class above and beyond caring about the abolition of slavery. If you really wish to free slaves, then go to Wickham in this county, and you will find the laborers thin, ragged, shivering, dejected mortals such as never were seen in any other country upon Earth. He's a controversial figure, undoubtedly. Racist, anti-Semitic, deeply problematic in, the, in many, many ways, but a fascinating voice of resistance. Cobbett's outrage sets the scene for the century to come. And the struggle for art is to keep up with the pace of change. Because industry marches on, taking workers from the fields, ripping up landscapes like the iron and coal valleys of South Wales. Merthyr was very much a draw to all the people in the surrounding counties because the iron industry itself was the best paid work a working class person could get. In delicate watercolour, one artist documents the awesome scale of one of Merthyr Tydfil's great blast furnaces producing iron 24 hours a day by 1825. What I love about this picture is that it's a window into industrial Merthyr in a time before photography. This is just one rolling mill in one ironworks in a town full of four ironworks, countless rolling mills, countless furnaces, and this looks gigantic in scale, chaotic in work, but it is very much a kind of photorealistic painting. Henry Williams' watercolour depicts each stage of the iron-making process in meticulous detail, right down to individual sparks flying up into the night. When you look at the light overall being cast around the image, like the light coming off the puddling furnace, for example, is really lighting up a whole section and the shadows coming off the puddler himself are so dramatic. But then equally, when you come over to the rollers, there's a different type of light the red hot glowing of the iron. The light really fills this vast space. It's like a cathedral to industry, if you like. It's the iron metropolis of the world. It's the flames, it's the sparks, it's the, it must have been extremely noisy. This is a town which never sleeps. A lot of people come into the town would say, oh, have you been to Merthyr? And they would say, yes, but have you been to Merthyr at night? Because that was the real spectacle of coming to Merthyr, seeing the whole valley lit up, this molten on fire section of the world, which would have absolutely blown people away. They felt that they were going into the bowels of hell, that it was, was satanic. Uh, it's a thrill. This is Gothic, and at that time, you know, Gothic means you're experiencing something which sends shivers down your spine, but it's also exciting. But Penry Williams is in the pay of one of Merthyr's iron tycoons. He depicts the beauty of industry, but keeps the accompanying slums and squalor out of frame. It's in an unguarded earlier painting made when he was a boy that we glimpse something of the raw realities of industrial life. Henry, at the age of 14, captured one of the large-scale riots that went on in Merthyr in 1816. The scale of which Merthyr was growing was unprecedented in Wales, and so at some point, all of the people here were gaining momentum to fight for certain rights and certain equalities and things like that. They're all living under hellish conditions, closely together, but also it's a double whammy. They speak Welsh. We cannot influence them with government literature, and that's so dangerous. If we look at Wales in the 19th century, the split is not so much between town and country. The split is uh, between English capitalism and that Welsh-speaking working class very prone to rebellion and riot. Despite another violent uprising in 1831, iron continues to flow out of Merthyr and fuels the explosion of the railways. 
Now it's steam, speed and lives lived to the new standardised time that runs the railway timetable. People migrate along the railways into industrial centres, seeking work and opportunities. By 1851, for the first time in history, more people live in towns and cities than in Cobbett's countryside. In the mid-19th century, it really is Manchester in particular that comes to stand in for this symbol of what a modern industrial city is. It's about money, international trade, goods coming in, manufactured items going out across the globe. But behind all that, street after street after street of poverty, people dying as a result of the risks they're taking in the factory and the spread of disease in their homes. The promise of Manchester, and also its inequalities, are brought to life by a novelist, Elizabeth Gaskell. In a work edited and serialised by Charles Dickens, she tells the story of a young woman leaving the countryside for a new life in the cotton capital. There's this wonderful sense within North and South of the South not understanding the North. And it was the North which was the future, and it was the North which was enterprising and wealth-creating and visionary. North and South is the story of Margaret Hale, a 19-year-old young woman, well-educated, who travels from a home in the New Forest up to the city that's called Milton Northern in this, but it's, it's clearly a very lightly fictionalised Manchester. As they reach Milton, the air had a faint taste and smell of smoke. Quick, they were whirled over long, straight, hopeless streets of regular-built houses, all small and of brick. Here and there, a great oblong, many-windowed factory stood up, like a hen among her chickens. Every van, every wagon and truck bore cotton, either in the raw shape in bags or the woven shape in bales of calico. In North and South, Gaskell wrestles with the shock of the city, moving between romance and social polemic. Margaret Hale marries an industrialist, but Gaskell also makes sure to document poverty she's seen with her own eyes. Margaret Hale sees a vision of the city that really horrifies her. And that's Gaskell, I think, saying to the reader, look, this is what you should be horrified by. Gaskell is campaigning for and helping the poor of Manchester. She's getting her hands dirty as a human being and as the wife of a minister, as well as as a novelist. We're very aware now of issues around child labour, and it's one of the things that Gaskell exposes in her novel through Bessie Higgins, the young factory girl who is dying of poisoning from inhaling the, the fibres from the cotton mill. I've never been right since I began work in the carding room and the fluff got in my lungs and poisoned me, said Bessie. Fluff? said Margaret inquiringly. Fluff, repeated Bessie. Little bits as fly off for the cotton that fill the air till it looks all fine white dust. They say it winds round the lungs and tightens them up. There's many a one that falls into a waste, coughing and spitting blood because they're just poisoned by the fluff. Now, I wouldn't call Elizabeth Gaskell a socialist, but I think the fact that a woman in that time was, was charting the, the terrible conditions that people were living in, what she was doing at the time was, was groundbreaking. She's been in the community. You feel she has, obviously, an, an empathy with people she's writing about. While writers draw attention to the human cost of progress, Architects struggle to express their critique of the city through new ways of building. In Glasgow, one idealist has a vision for improving the lives of workers. 
He's lost four of his children to the diseases ravaging the British Empire's booming second city. Alexander Great Thompson was highly respected as a promoter of, of what architecture can do for a city, as well, of course, as being an absolutely, you know, spectacular architect in his own right. Fiona Sinclair is an architect who works to repair and preserve historic buildings. In 1850s England, the trend for new civic building projects is to recreate a medieval golden age. But in Scotland, Greek Thompson runs against the grain, a radical visionary drawn to a different past. A time, of course, when the country was in the thrall of the Gothic, his work was deeply unfashionable. But it, it wasn't really Greek revival. Thompson's work was Greek with a twist of Egyptian and Assyrian. It was very, very individual. It was quite, quite unique. Thompson's architecture took the empire into Scotland. Its cues from classical, Egyptian and Oriental architecture, history and design helped to create a sense that this was the imperial city at the time. Scotland was Greece to England's Rome. England had the power and wealth. Scotland had the intellect and innovation. He had the opportunity to design a whole range of buildings, from uh, very beautiful villas, such as Homewood House, which was designed for a paper mill owner. He designed commercial buildings, like the Grecian Chambers, three fantastic churches, through to extremely unusual tenements, such as Walmer Crescent. Built on a grander scale with more space, light and privacy, Thompson sees Walmer Crescent as a new standard for Glasgow tenement living. Thompson went about trying to better the life of Glasgow citizens through architecture, through buildings. He was described by those who knew him as an extremely genial, a kind, a compassionate man, and he was interested in the sort of social responsibility that comes with being an architect. But Thompson's career ends in failure. He's overshadowed by the celebrity of Charles Rennie Mackintosh and his vision for redeveloping the slums with roomier tenements, complete with glazed rooftops and safer places for children to play, is shelved. He was embracing the technology. He was pushing plate glass to, to the limit as large as he possibly could. He was pushing wrought iron and cast iron to the limits. That really is, it's, it's modern thinking. The dream of transforming city lives is shared by another idealist down south. But he works with something altogether more intimate and everyday. Probably the most influential artist of the Victorian era um, would be William Morris. These are the great landscape artworks of the 19th century. It's not Turner and Constable, it's these, which were then replicated throughout people's homes and throughout the world. It's not just a picture in a frame, it's like a whole room, it's installation. Think about a city in Victorian Britain it would have been black. Every building would have been black. The sky, you wouldn't have seen the sun as much as you, we do now. There'd have been smogs, there'd have been dirt, disgusting things everywhere, all the shit on the streets, everything. And then you have this in your house. This has personality, it's beautiful. Jeremy Deller is a Turner Prize-winning conceptual artist whose work, like Morris's, is deeply human and plays on English history and folklore. Hello, I'm Jeremy Deller. I'm the artist on this project. 
And it's actually quite moving going through these. I mean, this is just something else. But what I love about these, I absolutely love about these, is you don't, you go from page to page and you don't really know what's coming next. William Morris created a whole range of objects, be it wallpapers, stained glass, furniture. He saw a way of introducing art into people's everyday lives. This utopian sense of improving people's environments. I think he was, he was attacking the Industrial Revolution with beauty. That's his arrow, that's his sword, is, is these beautiful designs to fight against mediocrity and ugliness. So it's a way of just carpeting the modern world with nature. William Morris. Well, he's the son of a wealthy family with all the attributes that that sort of life would bestow upon him. And he gets radicalised and he becomes, in his own terms, a communist. He associates the cause of revolution with the recovery of crafts, weaving, all those sorts of things, printing. Morris, really taking inspiration from the medieval world, he wanted things made by hand, things that had that special, artistic, unique and distinctive quality. And what he sees all around him is people who are becoming dislocated from reality, from nature, from life, from doing things by hand. And he wants to reconnect us with the things that really matter. And he does it in ways that speak to the 21st century, that all around us, that people are becoming alienated by, by machinery, by the speed of life. So on one hand, he's decorating houses of American industrialists in Britain, palaces, literary palaces in the UK, in London, and then he's writing these books. Useful work, useless toil, the principles of socialism, revolutionary studies, monopoly or how labour is robbed, and great titles, chance for socialists. Despite his firebrand politics, Morris's vision for changing the world relies on city commerce. He opens a shop on London's Oxford Street and, like contemporary artists, surrounds himself with a team of assistants. The thing about Morris is he was about 100 years ahead of any artist. I did a show about Morris and Andy Warhol a few years ago because I felt they had a lot in common, not least their love of printmaking, but also the idea of commerce and the shop. They both wanted to popularise their work. They both had uh, upbringings as children where they were quite ill, where they retreated into a fantasy world. Morris was all about medieval romance, whereas Warhol's was about Hollywood. They were in the midst of turbulent political moments and they were commenting upon it. His ideas would have seemed you know, deeply revolutionary, radical at the time. But that's also where he fails, because if you think, even though his work could have been bought on Oxford Street, for most people, they could not afford that wallpaper. They couldn't afford those prints. You know, it's a dream that is, is fictional and it satisfies him and his friends. But for the sort of people that he actually, I think, designed this conception, to benefit, I don't think it touched them in any great, in any great way. While some artists like Morris try to engage with city living, others turn their back on it. Some of Morris's early associates share his idealism about arts of the past, but they go further, taking a stand against the march of the modern world. They reject the city and retreat to the country. The Pre-Raphaelites are Britain's first avant-garde, in-your-face arts movement in the 19th century. They basically told the artistic establishment, the Royal Academy, we don't believe anything that's been done, really, since the Renaissance has been of much value in the world of art. To Victorian eyes, Pre-Raphaelite art, with its vivid colours and details, seems shockingly new. And yet, in its subjects, it harks back to an idealised, mythical past. Some people think the 
didn't address the problems of their time. That you should look at the state of the working class in Manchester or wherever it was, and you should engage with that reality. The Pre-Raphaelites don't do that. What they tend to do is they escape into distant remote worlds. They escape into myth as well as into antiquity. But the Pre-Raphaelites are more forward-thinking about new values needed for city life, particularly around sex and the feminine. There was a side of these people that was mob. Their, their attempt, and of course they were all men, so they got it horribly wrong, but their attempt at a new gender politics. It's very difficult to get around the fact that men are the gazers in these paintings and women are those that are looked at. A lot of paintings are castigating Victorian society for its exploitation of women. But at the same time, there's a voluptuousness to pre-Raphaelite painting. There's a relishing of especially the female body. Few paintings embody the contradiction more than Proserpine, the masterpiece by one of the leading pre-Raphaelites, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. When I first saw Proserpine, the redness of the fruit echoing the redness of her lips, her hair long and lustrous, it's so compelling. I fell in love. At surface level, Proserpine depicts an ancient classical myth, a goddess kidnapped by the god of the underworld, Hades, to be his wife. Can we just see a little flash of light, the little glimpse of the world she might escape to at some point, that, but there's this sense of the woman confined, the woman who's forcibly removed from the world. What it becomes is a story of male control of women, of a woman who's trapped in a marriage. Rossetti's dig at marriage has a hidden personal agenda. He's having an affair with the model who poses as Proserpine, Jane Burden, and she's married to his friend, William Morris. Here we have Jane Morris presented as someone who is captive. She was a muse and a model for Rossetti for many decades, but she was also his lover. It's the story of a love triangle. Rossetti paints this as, I think, a message about a kind of liberation for women. But in its intentions, one has to... one has to question it. The pre-Raphaelite preoccupation with myth and morality is hugely influential in the Victorian world, and it plays out even through a cutting-edge technology. When photography starts to take Victorian cities by storm, many hail it as a science, a way to document their fast-changing world more accurately. But one woman sees its potential as an art form, a rule-breaker with a startlingly modern gaze. Julia Margaret Cameron takes photographs of people to capture something in their mood, something in their personality. There's a great psychological depth and complexity to them, and the way they gaze out at you in this very brazen, direct way. I mean, a lot of you know, so-called classic Victorian images, you know, women look demurely away like that, or have a simpering smile on their face. But these, you know, figures, you know, men and particularly the women, they look at you with these clear eyes and these unfathomable expressions.
Julia Margaret Cameron used light in a very dramatic way, so you can see that here, where the figures emerge from darkness. And she left a lot of flaws visible in her work. But she was highly criticized in her own time. There was definitely a kind of sexist um, angle to a lot of the criticism she received, because she was often talked about as if she, she didn't really understand how to use her equipment um, because she was just a woman. She couldn't really handle it properly. And in fact, by making things less literal, she was making photographs that were more poetic. Yet despite all her innovative methods, Cameron is still a product of her time, conservative in her choice of subject and scenes. She reworks traditional mythology in photo after photo. Some of her best-known images are commissioned by her friend, poet laureate, Alfred Lord Tennyson. His Idylls of the King, a revival of Arthurian myth for the Victorian age, is a bestseller. When Tennyson asks Cameron to illustrate a people's edition, she dresses up her own family and friends as models. Julia Margaret Cameron's husband, Charles Cameron, supposedly kept giggling while Julia Margaret Cameron was making the photographs. He couldn't hold still and ruined many plates. Histrionic and posed, only at the edges do Cameron's photographs hint at any challenge to prevailing power and morals. So here we see Lancelot and Guinevere. This is one of the most beautiful photographs, I think, in the volume. It's quite tender, the, the touch between them. But there's a kind of tension, I think, because they have a relationship that's not quite proper. This is the gallant world of the Knights of the Round Table. Though there's a nice appealing irony in that, which is, of course, that King Arthur is the man whose wife has run off with Lancelot. He's another Victorian in a loveless marriage. As Cameron looks backwards into worlds of medieval romance, Fantasy and nostalgia also feed the visual culture of the Victorian city, covered with new and ever more urgent images. In the 1880s, services boom on the back of Britain's thriving manufacturing industries. In cities, brands clamor for the consumer's attention. Until now, text has dominated advertising on billboards in newspapers and magazines, but advertising is about to be transformed as art is captured by commerce. When we look back on this period, this painting by Millet, it's one that we probably all know, and I think that I can imagine Millet slightly in his grave grinding his teeth at the thought of the reasons why we do know it. In his early 20s, John Everett Millet had been one of the original pre-Raphaelite rebels, but by his 50s, he is giving the public what they want. Millet was a painter who specialized in child portraits. He knew the public loved poetic, sentimental images of children. In 1886, he produced a painting of his four-year-old grandson, Willie James, He's wearing this little Lord Fauntleroy suit, blowing a bubble and gazing up like a little cherub in awe of this wonderful sphere. So there's a sinister touch to that image. The bubble is actually symbolic of the transience of life. The bubble will burst, the illusion will burst. He will grow old and will eventually die. Copies of Millet's painting proved popular in the homes of Britain's swelling suburbs. And the work catches the attention of Thomas Barrett, a director of the pair's soap company. Thomas Barrett purchases the painting and the copyright, just over £2,000, 
And then he spends about £30,000 on an aggressive marketing campaign. It's fascinating taking such a sort of well-known piece of art and almost the audacity of then saying it's going to be for my brand. Kate Stanners is global chief creative officer of Saatchi and Saatchi. She sees Barrett's ad as a breakthrough in the art of selling. You think, oh my God, yes. Beautiful skin, a child, innocence. You know, it's all those other attributes that you want for your, for your product. There must have been a bit of a eureka moment, however they came across this painting. You're so right to think you just go, yes. How much? Yeah. We trade in images. In, in advertising, we attach ourselves to things that will be, a, a, I suppose, a shortcut to emotion and connection. And I think that image did that. It, it, it sort of fast-tracked the brand. I think the whole piece is very integrated, actually. Mm -hmm. the, the bubble, the way a pair sits behind it, the, the way the soap being sort of added as a product is such a complete piece of advertising. I just love how small the soap is, like, I think, <laughs> and it's quite simple. Like, nowadays, I think we'd be challenged to make the product so much bigger. We're not seeing the product being used for what it's supposed to be used for, like, uh, you know, cleaning. It's, it's actually the kid is playing with the product. I think it's, it's quite original to see that in, in, in an advert and unexpected. <laughs> It sells everywhere. Everyone sees it. Everyone loves it. In the first throws of the campaign, Millet is delighted. And then his friends, his dealer, various critics, they start to say, this is pretty sad, isn't it? You know, the old man sold out. He's basically now compromised his place in art history. I think with this image, you do get a sense of shock about it. Art, traditionally, was, was a separate domain. And what this painting shows us is a new compact emerging where art is being drawn in to the service of commerce. But some artists react against this cosy metropolitan world in which art has a price. They fight back with new individuality and flair. Truth-tellers attacking convention in paint and words, shaking up the hypocrisies of city society. In the 1890s, Irish playwright Oscar Wilde is the darling of West End theatre-goers. They love his wit, though it's full of barbs at what he calls the native land of the hypocrite. Wilde, an Irishman in London, he has that sense of doubleness, knowing exactly how English society works, but with just enough distance to stick a pin in it, to laugh at it. For Wilde, art should feel a bit dangerous. It shouldn't feel safe. Wilde is saying, all human experience should be art. Get rid of your moral rule book. Don't tell me I can't show certain things in a picture or in a novel. No censorship, please. <laughs> Wilde puts his manifesto for living into his only novel, a daring gothic horror that challenges social hypocrisy. The picture of Dorian Gray is when Wilde really steps forward as the man who will challenge the moral assumptions of Victorian England, who will flirt with evil. What happens in the story? There's a beautiful young man called Dorian who is looked at and talked about as beautiful by other men a lot of the time. There's this two somewhat older men who befriend and admire him. One is the painter Basil Hallward, who paints this painting of Dorian. And at one point, Dorian says, looking at this beautiful painting by Basil, I wish that I could remain looking always like this painting. I wish I could remain beautiful forever. It's this Faustian moment. So this is a man who gets seduced by the world of decadence. And of course, the, the deal he makes is that instead of this taking a toll on his own beautiful face, it will age the portrait. 
the painting goes into the attic and sure enough, it becomes horribly disfigured as Dorian Gray follows every appetite and whim. He is living a highly debauched life around the opium dens of London. I determined to go out in search of some adventure. I felt that this gray, monstrous London of ours, with its myriads of people, its sordid sinners, and its splendid sins, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. Wilde is constantly pushing back at 19th century morals. He's unafraid to show the mirror up to society and show the hypocrisies by which society functions. That everybody knows this is going on, it's just we're not supposed to name it or talk about it in this way. Oscar Wilde is always talking about artifice. And I'm really, really interested in how, like, creating yourself on your own terms is a rebellion. So for me, I've always decided to treat myself as something that's separate to the, what I was taught to be, because my God, I am very different to what I was taught to be. At school, I discovered Oscar Wilde and the sort of power of language as a weapon and also kind of costume and, and camp also as a weapon, as a kind of, I'm enjoying my campiness so much, so how could you ever make fun of me? You know, you must treat yourself as a work of art and create yourself for yourself. That's the only way you'll be able to reject societal conditioning. The aim of life is self-development, to realize one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty that one owes to oneself. Of course, they are charitable, they feed the hungry and clothe the beggar, but their own souls starve and are naked. He's great. For someone coming from Dublin, which is still one of the most small town big cities in the world, to encounter um, a metropolis like London, a place where you can slip through, where you can be anonymous, where you can be more than one person, where you can be someone leading a double or triple life, is an intense spur to creativity. Picture of Dorian Gray is a, a novel about doubles, and one of those doubles is between the East End and the West End. Where the West End is, I mean, it is affluent. Um, it's the place of theater, of, you know, city lights, of city living. And the East End is the darker, murkier underside. You've got Jews in their sweatshops. You've got Indian laborers, Chinese laborers. It's really positing the East End as the other to the West End that needs to be kind of controlled or repressed. At the very end of the novel, Dorian Gray can't stand having this artistic record of his sins and stabs the painting, but then is found in this great turn of events. The servants break into the room, and what they find is the body of a hideously ugly man with an aged face with a knife in his heart. For Wilde, Dorian Gray is a book that puts his reputation on the line because it's a very lightly coded way of saying, this is a novel about illegal homosexual acts. In the event, Wilde's book is part of his downfall when his affair with a young aristocrat blows up into a public scandal. In 1895, he's put on trial. And in a kind of actually very Wildean gesture, it is the picture of Dorian Gray that is put forward as evidence at the trial of Wilde's Borch behaviors. And so in some ways, this fits with Wilde's model of these movements between art and life. Wilde is jailed for two years and dies soon after in 1900. He has taken on the establishment, but ultimately been destroyed by it. 
a failure in his own lifetime, but with a profound creative legacy. As the 20th century dawns, London has become the biggest city in the world. Artist Walter Sickert attempts to picture the humanity lost in its grind and grime, the alienation of the anonymous metropolis seeping into lives, twisting relationships. If Wilde plays with the veneer of London's nightlights, Sickert is about London in the cold grey of morning. I think the reality of Sickert draws me to him. And there's something always slightly menacing about his paintings. I think he was like making an, a, a comment on the inequality in London, in the city and how, what a struggle it was for people to survive and to find a way of coping, because it was all, would all have been about coping. He was interested in the real underbelly. Welsh artist Shani Rhys James, like Sickert, used to live in the grimy railway suburb of Camden. I've left London. I've left the city and I'm painting still about London, really. I'm still painting about the city. I want to get to the real grimy reality. And that's what Sickert does. He has this ability to get right into the sort of dark, emotional, personal, intimate interior of a, of a space in, in, in these bed sits. I think there's a, very much a parallel with Sickert here of two figures in a room. I just wanted to portray really the sort of sense of somebody in the bed, in their own little world, and then her sort of sense of isolation and maybe a bit frustrated and a bit angry perhaps, I don't know. There is a narrative, an enigmatic narrative that you also get in the Sickert the same kind of relationship between two figures that's not necessarily comfortable. You're not quite sure quite what's going on. This painting of Sickert's here, you've got the man with his hands clasped and the woman lying prostrate on the bed. It's a tawdry interior of two figures and there's a psychological drama going on, but we don't know what this drama is about. Sickert for me is one of the greatest painters that ever lived. In part, it's about a particular purity of ambition that he sought with paint and canvas to tell the truth. So you could almost smell the B.O. in those spaces. You were really there. You were there seeing the world through Sickert's eyes. And it wasn't an easy space to be in. These are, are really profoundly distasteful paintings, I think. And they show a London that is morally in decay. Who are these people? Why are they in this situation? What is Sickert doing wanting to show us this? Is he wanting to show us something squalid? Is he relishing that in some way? There's a power relationship going on here between the, sort of, you know, the woman who's often splayed on the bed. The viewer is placed in the position of a voyeur and maybe a potential a killer or a rapist. Adding to this uncertainty, 
After a notorious 1907 killing of a young woman, Sickert names one painting in the series The Camden Town Murder or What Shall We Do for the Rent, implying prostitution. These are working class bodies who have this appalling diet. And this diet either makes them scrawny or thin or bloated and misshapen. Paint is very important, the abstracting. He's abstracting the image of the body. The visceral quality of paint was a thing that expressed the body. So it's not just about the body, it's about the paint being the body. Paint is almost slashed on as the body's being cut with a palette knife. So it's something very aggressive about it, and the flesh is being unviolated. For me as a woman, it is troubling to see those paintings of women treated like a piece of meat on, on the bed. But you could see it from a misogynistic point of view that he is debasing women. As a feminist, you could say, well, actually, that is that did happen, you know. Women were treated like that. In a way, he's showing that vulnerability of the woman in, in the city. If he's meditating about the nature of modern life, painting these at the dawn of a new century, there's not much hope in them. The idea is that, you know, human life is rather banal, ordinary. There's this threat of exploitation or violence. He's not interested in pretty little things. He wants to say, well, look, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. Look at it to these rich people people in their high-rise houses and they're having their champagne or having their brandy. He's saying, you know, this is reality. Sickert's intense individual approach, unflinching eye and expressive paint address the challenge of the new mass urban age, capturing something of the daily realities in the suburban sprawl. The culmination of a century of lives run to the new beat of industry, sometimes at great cost, to which art has borne witness. And when we look back at this century of progression, it's about a recognition of those people who would otherwise have been forgotten. It was the creative people who gave those people a voice. Everything is changing. Everything is being transformed. What the creative arts have done is they've helped people understand who they were, who they are, and to think, perhaps fearfully, of what's coming down the pipe. Next time, what's coming is war. As the British Empire rises and falls, artists react to an age of conflagration. When did you last subvert the status quo? Be inspired by some of the incredible but overlooked individuals who disrupted history with their creativity. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash art that made us and follow the links to the Open University.